we are live fast or more yep it looks like we're live yep we're live are you are you going to also record yes um, fast i'll also do that okay there we are and travis is coming in too so here we go great All right, I'll let you and Travis take over then. Okotov, Travis. You're muted. Bokertov. Yes, Bokertov, and good morning. Yes, good morning. We are actually Facebook Live, Travis, so we're going to let you get us started. Awesome. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Relational uh, Restoration Gathering that uh, I think we've been doing this for about a year or more, actually more. Yes, it's almost two years now, Travis. Okay, so forgive my uh, date. I was almost 100% <laughs> or 50% wrong, however you do the math. Well, we are, um, we've are we been having a great time in every one of these meetings. We are very, very grateful for um, Janice's work with TJC2. and um, uh, I, my life has personally been blessed and enriched by uh, these times of gathering together and meeting so many wonderful people and enriching my understanding of the scriptures. Uh, today, we're going to be blessed with Melissa David. Thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and thank you all for um, joining. I see Dr. Judith is on from Africa. And uh, we have some people from Dallas. Last Last uh, month, I got to hear that beautiful Dallas accent um, with our, our friend from there. And so we, I see someone new from Dallas, so welcome. And uh, welcome to all of you that are gathering again with us. Um, we're so grateful to be together today. And I know that, um, I hope our hearts just get uh, just enriched and also encouraged as we are worshiping together because this is one of the first times that we'll actually have an extended time of worship and uh, in Yeshua's presence. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. So we're grateful for God's hand upon today and making this possible. And uh, we also pray the technology is just going to be smooth and streamlined today and uh, they, that enables us just to bask in the Lord's presence. So I'm going to open this up with prayer and hand it over to um a brief prayer to hand it over to Aichi. She's going to pray for us. And uh, Father, I just thank you for this opportunity for each one of us to be together. Uh, Lord, we give you praise because your hand has guided all this. Lord, we commit this time to you in the name of Yeshua. Amen. And I want to hand it over to our friend Aichi and who will uh, take it from here. Thanks. Um, I started with the prayer. Um, Heavenly Father, the God of Most High, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah of the Jews and of the world, we thank you for setting this time for us. We pray that you set our hearts apart to be encouraged and to set Melissa's word and his, her music to be your testimony to build us up. We humbly present the following time before you and ask your blessing and protection. The prayer is in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah of Jews and Messiah of ours. Amen. Well, um, I want to, before Melissa does our first opening song, I want to take a second and find out where people are from because I have a drop down menu on my right that shows me some people but some people I can't see and I would like some people just to tell us briefly your name where you're joining from you can unmute yourself your name where you're joining from and um, uh, what ministry you're a part of uh, how, how you were led to this so I would like to meet some of you if that's okay Don't be shy. Looks like we've got a quiet group, huh, Travis? 
Well, someone's trying to talk. Um, the lady from Dallas, you're I think you're trying to, inter there you go. Right, well, sorry. If no one else is going to introduce themselves. <laughs> This is Dave and Raquel Piles, and we leave the, lead the intercession for TJC2. We're from Baruch Hashem, Messianic Congregation in Dallas. Uh, Rabbi Marty is the, uh, well, he stepped down, but you know, he was the senior pastor. And now his son has stepped up, which is a great, a great blessing to us. Thank you, Raquel. Yes. Welcome, Raquel and Dave. It's so yeah. good to have you guys. Thank you. So He'll be here in a minute. <laughs> okay. Okay, who else? Hi, um, Donna from uh, Beth Messiah Congregation in uh, Columbus. Woo! Welcome, Donna. Thanks, Donna. And, and as yes. you can see, I've stopped. I'm in my car, so I'm going to get back to it here. <laughs> <laughs> Have a safe trip wherever you're going. Thank you. Who else? I don't know Bill Coralini. Uh, Bill from Beth Messiah in Columbus. All right. Another Columbus. We have a strong Bill. contingent from Columbus. Wow. Yes. Thanks, Bill. Hello, Shalom, Dave. Good to see you. Hello, everybody. Judith. Yes, I'm, I'm Judith Atella from Kenya. I'm walking back home, so I don't want to put my my video on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yo, thanks for letting me join the fellowship today. Welcome, Dr. Judy. Good to see you. Well, hey, well, let's go to... Um... You know, if you, the early bird gets the worm, I'm grateful for those that jumped on and introduced themselves. Let's go over to Melissa. And Melissa, I, I think you may have a song for us. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. And uh, I, I really believe that God has good things in store for us this morning because I've had an unprecedented amount of attack on my sound system, <laughs> all kinds of things. And uh and I'm going to be kind of going a little bit um, uh, spontaneously here because of the fact that my sound system wasn't working properly. I can't use my piano. So I'm using my guitar this morning. So I'm just, I'm opening it up to the Lord to whatever he wants me to share musically wise. It'll be a little different than I originally planned. But, but I wanted to open with one of my original songs. It's called Hoshiana. And it comes from Psalms chapter 118, which I'll just read. Psalms 118, verse 25. O Lord, save us. O Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine upon us. And so this is a song that we sing during some of the, the feasts of Adonai when we're going up for, Sukho, uh, for um, Shavuot, it's sung, for Pesach, it's sung. And this is really a cry from the heart of the bride to the bridegroom, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If any of you know this, I think some from Beth Messiah in Columbus know this, um, from Baruch Hashem in Dallas, if you may know this song. So this is Hoshiana. Um, I do have the lyrics on a PowerPoint. I'm not, I've never shared screen before. I can try. Should I try that? Yeah. Let me see. I, okay, I think, host. I think we've made your co-host. Uh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. So don't worry about it. Let's just go with the flow. I'll just translate for you right now. So um, Hoshiana Yeshua HaMashiach Ben David. Save us now, Yeshua the Messiah, the son of David. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach Ben David. 
Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah, the son of David.
Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We look, we look up to the skies, Lord. We look up to the skies where you went, you ascended, and now we look up to the skies where you will return again in power and in great glory upon the clouds of heaven. And Lord, how it's our heart's desire and our heart's cry that your people would cry out, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. Lord, that all Israel would see you as you are, see you as the Messiah, the one that was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the one whose punishment brought us peace, and now the one who is ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father. So Lord, we just pray that, and, and Lord, as, as I share this morning, I just pray that your Holy Spirit, your Ruach HaKodesh, would give me unction, that as I open my mouth, you would fill it, Lord, with whatever it is that you would have to say to us this morning. I pray that you would impart your heart to those listening, whether they be on this Zoom call or on Facebook Live or who will watch the replay later, Lord, that you would impart your heart. Lord, just may we um, be captured by your heart and your plan this morning. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, I pray. Amen. 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 We are very thankful for uh, worship. How many are thankful? Amen. This opportunity to join, to join in, in uh, yes. prayer and praise to our Lord. And Janice is going to give us an, uh, a little bit more information um, about Melissa's ministry and who she is. And, and uh, so, Janice, will you, will you uh, take it away? Okay, Travis, thank you. Beautiful worship, Melissa. It really ushered us into the presence of Adonai. Thank you so much. We are so excited this month. Um, our speaker is a dear friend of mine, a very dear sister of mine, and many of you also may know her. But Melissa has served in the Messianic Music Ministry for nearly 20 years, both in an international capacity as a traveling performer and recording artist, and also on a local level to the four Messianic congregations in which she has served as a worship leader. Melissa currently resides in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, where she's involved in worship ministry and teaching at Beth Shanika under the leadership of Rabbi Khalid Goldberg. She will be sharing both her original music, which she just did beautiful with us this morning, and she will be speaking to us about the power of clinging to God's people, having the heart of root. Melissa, welcome to TJC2 Council 2 gathering, and please bless us. Thank you, Janice. Thank you so much. I just realized that I don't have a watch anywhere in front of me, <laughs> so I'll have to uh, move my Zoom meeting here, but um, it's an honor to uh, be invited to share my own personal testimony with you of how God imparted within me the heart of Ruth, as one who, as far as I know, was born from the nations, uh, never done the, the testing that so many people like to do now to find their gene genealogy, but um, I was raised in a Christian home. So I just want to, before I go into um, share my personal testimony, I just want to quickly recap the book of Ruth for anybody who is watching that might not be so familiar. Um, Janice had expressed to me that there's a there's a range of, of people watching and listening today, some who are very new to this whole idea of Jew and Gentile, one and Messiah, and going back to the foundations of the and the roots of our faith. And then there's some that might be a little more experienced. So uh, in order to explain what I'm talking about when I'm saying having a heart of Ruth, you need to know the story of the, the, the book of Ruth. And so we find Ruth, um, right after Judges in the uh, Tanakh, in the Old Testament. And um, just to be very brief, um, the story centers around Naomi and Elimelech, uh, a Jewish couple who had to leave Bethlehem, uh, the house of bread. They had to leave and uh, go into a foreign land because of famine. And Naomi's um, two sons married Moabitess, um, women, so they were not Jewish women. 
And what happened, uh, we read through the story, is that Naomi's husband, Elimelech, eventually died, leaving her a widow. And then shortly after, her two sons also died, leaving her daughters-in-law widow, widows as well. And the, the crux of the story is that when Naomi found out that God was doing something in, back in Bethlehem, the house of bread, uh, she decided to return. And she implored her daughters-in-law, who were you know, not Israelites, not Jewish, to, to go back to their family, to go back to the people from which they came. Um, and the two daughters-in-law, one being Orpah, whose name translated means the back of the neck, and one named Ruth, whose name translated means friend. They made very different decisions. Orpah did um, listen to Naomi and she went back to her own people, whereas Ruth said, and this is one of the most beautiful scriptures in this whole book. This is Ruth chapter one, uh, verse 16. So Naomi is beseeching Ruth to go back to her own people. She says, I have nothing for you. Can I give you a new husband? Can I, you know, bring you children? But Ruth replied to Naomi, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. Bethlehem. And so Ruth, whose name means friend, decided in her heart that she was going to cling to her mother-in-law, who was from a different people, even though for her at that time it meant nothing um, positionally, financially, property-wise, but God put it within her heart to, to worship, to follow the God of Israel as her God, to cling to God's people as her people. Um, Ruth meaning friend, Orpah, the other daughter-in-law, the, the name meaning the back of the neck, she turned. It's interesting. The name means the back of the neck. She turned and walked the other way. And so it's a beautiful picture of, um, God's plan, and this is kind of where I'm going to get into my personal testimony. So this is a historical book. And what happens towards the end of the book is that um, Boaz comes on the scene. Boaz, the name Boaz means strength. And in the days of when this was happening, property was very important and redeeming one who um, a family member who had, you know, been widowed like Naomi was important with, with property rights and familial, the carrying on of the fa uh, fam family name. And so Boaz, one of Naomi's kinsmen redeemer, marries Ruth. So Ruth becomes part of the lineage then that leads up to, as it says in the end of the book, um, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went to her and the Lord enabled her to conceive and she gave birth to a son. The woman said to Naomi, praise to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. And the name of the child was Obed. He was the father of Jesse who became the father of King David, Melech David. And so this is a key to this to this book, because Ruth, a Gentile woman, becomes part of the lineage of King David, who is a type and a foreshadowing of Messiah, who will sit on the throne of David. And so this is both a historical book in the sense of, you know, this happening to these people historically, but it's also a prophetic book. And that's where I'm going to be sharing from my own story, because Right now, we are in the time period of awaiting the Lord's second coming. And I really see this book as being a picture of what we see in Ephesians, Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah. When we partner together with God, when we say, your people will be my people, your God will be my God. What's birthed out of that is the Messiah's return. And um, it's I would have to prepare a whole teaching on that to explain that. I want to get into to my own personal story, but this story is a, 
a story of the faithfulness and the goodness of God. The, like I said, the, the place of the Gentiles in God's plan. It's not just a historical book, but a prophetic one. And so to get into my own personal story. So as I said at the beginning, I was born into a, a Gentile home. My parents are both uh, actually immigrants from Germany. They both grew up in, in uh, post-war Germany and uh, grew up in the church. My dad is actually an ordained minister in the Anglican Church of Canada. So I've basically always known the Lord. I was uh, born again at the age of 10. I uh, kind of always grew up with faith in the home. And um, but in my early 20s, I was in university and I started to have what I would call not a crisis of faith, but I was asking a lot of questions. And deep down in my heart, I knew that there was something missing in my faith. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it at the time. I was wrestling a lot and I had a conversation with my mom at some point. I, I think I might have been 21, 22. And I said, I don't know what it is. I don't know what I'm wrestling with, but I feel like the answer lies in the Old Testament. There was just something I, I felt drawn to, you know, go into the Old Testament scriptures. I had grown up reading the New Testament, the Gospels, the Epistles, maybe a little bit of the Psalms, a little bit of the Proverbs, but I'd never really studied the Torah, uh, the Tanakh, you know, the, the first five books, the prophetic writings. Um, so I felt like that was the key. And my mom at that time, she was, she was feeling drawn into the messianic movement or the, the, um, the Hebraic roots movement. And the only exposure I had had to that point was a little tape that we had purchased back in 1988. I was eight years old of Paul Wilbur with Israel's Hope. And I knew at that time, I just loved the music being a, a musical, you know, from the time of being a child, being very musical. I loved the music and something about it drew me, but I had no idea what it meant. Even in my 20s, as I was listening to some of Paul Wilbur's music and I had a friend ask me, what does Yeshua HaMashiach mean? And I said, I don't know. I just love this music. <laughs> That's how, how, you know, how clueless I was about anything Jewish. And so as I'm going through this crisis of faith, um, my mom contacts um, Rabbi Cal and Jan Goldberg in Calgary. And I was living in Southern Alberta at the time, about two hours south, still finishing university. And uh, Rebitz and Jan said, well, we, we're actually coming to Lethbridge. There's a small home group there that's meeting in a home and we're actually going to be, we're overseeing it and we're going to be there this Shabbat. And so that was my first um, kind of push in this direction. And so to make a long story short, I showed up, I knew nothing, again, nothing about Messianic Judaism. All I knew of a rabbi was what you would picture a very Hasidic rabbi. You know, I was expecting to see a Hasidic rabbi, I knew nothing. And so I walk in the door and the door opened and Rebitz and Jan and, and the hostess uh, who, you know, whose home this meeting was taking place, they answered the door and in my spirit, in my inner man, I heard your home, your home, you've arrived home. And so that was the first taste. And so I started meeting with this group. And as we started digging into the Torah, into the scriptures, I found what I was looking for. And I would describe it as saying that throughout my Christian upbringing, in reading the New Testament scriptures, I felt like I had a book for, um, principles of living, you know, say the, the teachings of Yeshua and um, how to live a holy and godly life. Um, you know, some of the exhortations we find in Paul's writings and Peter's writings um, in, in the books of John. So I felt like I had that, but there was the root was missing. And what was missing was my understanding of the very God that I was serving, the nature, the character, the, the plan of God. Um, it's like I, I felt like I had the end of the book without the beginning, or I, I was trying to put together a puzzle with only five pieces when there were 5,000 other pieces that needed to complete the picture. And so when I started studying and I started, you know, going into Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, <laughs> Numbers, Deuteronomy, and the prophets, and I started to digest and I started to find Yeshua in these scriptures, 
my, I felt like my faith just exploded. And, you know, Deuteronomy and Exodus became my favorite books when, when in, in Exodus uh, chapter, let me flip to it quickly here, um, I believe it's chapter 15. Um, no, where is it here? Um, anyways, I can't find it uh, in my Bible, but when, uh, when Moses, um, when the glory of God passes before Moses and the Lord declares before him, I am Adonai, I am slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, keeping covenant with a thousand generations, and he proclaims his name. I just, I felt like this is my God. When you see the dealings of God with Israel, both um, the severity, but the compassion, when you see his plan, it, it unfolded the picture to me in such a way as I just felt that completion of my faith. And then it went on. So I got very involved in this, this messianic um, home group that was meeting. Um, and I got involved in a messianic uh, worship team then uh, as part of that group. That was my first foray into messianic worship ministry. I was always part of my church uh, worship ministry before I um, became connected with the movement. But then the main um, encounter I had with the Lord one day was I was reading the word and I felt the Holy Spirit direct me toward the book of Ruth. And I opened it up and I started reading. And as I was reading, I don't want to say that I had a, a vision. I generally don't have visions, but the easiest way to explain it is that as I was reading it, it became a movie and I was the main character. It was a supernatural encounter. I became Ruth and I, I was reading this and this was my life. And as I got to that scripture that I read earlier, your people shall be my people and your God will be my God. This was me. I just knew in the depth of my heart that this was me and that this was what God was calling me to, that he obviously had some kind of a plan for my life that involved me leaving my home background, my home people group, my home geographic area even, and uh, clinging to God's people. And over the course of the next few years, that became literally fulfilled in my life when I married into a Jewish family. I moved to Toronto. I started ministering within the Jewish community in Toronto and then North America wide through music. And so that really became my story. And you know, it's been nearly 20 years now, and I can truly say that I feel more at home with within the Jewish community, with Jewish people than I do, you know, from my, my background experience. And, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's, it's a, what's the word I'm trying to look for here? It's a powerful picture of what God wants to do. And, and we all have varying degrees, I think, of where God wants us in his plan. For me, it happened to be actually, you know, in a really full way. But I think having an understanding of this book and what God's heart is for his people is very important. And so some of the impact of that, now I want to share with you, uh, Janice, when she had contacted me to share how this has reached the Jewish community? How has your life, how has your, your story reached the Jewish community? Well, I have so many examples that I could give, and I've just picked a few here of how the Holy Spirit has been able to use my testimony as one that is like Ruth in order to really touch hearts and lives. So um, one, of the, one of the first ones after I actually had moved to Toronto, um, my husband and I were working together with a collaborator who is an Orthodox Jewish musician, uh, was Orthodox at the time. I think he's actually gone back to secularism now. He was really searching for depth. And I think he grew up secular and he was searching for God. And so he went into Orthodoxy and he, I don't know if he found what he was looking for there, but we were um, doing a recording with him. And uh, 
I was, we were newly married <laughs> and I think I was a little bit of a bone of contention because obviously in the Torah, Jewish people are forbidden from marrying outside of the faith or outside, you know, and so here I was this Gentile prairie girl <laughs> in, uh, in, in Toronto in the Jewish community. And I was, you know, it was kind of like, you know, a little bit like you don't belong here, you know, or, or why are, you know, questioning my husband, why did you marry a gentle, a Gentile girl? But anyway, we, we got to talking. And we were talking about Israel and I told him about my trip to Israel in 2009 and we were just chatting a little bit. And he said, you know, well, we're told never to go into the Christian churches in Jerusalem, for example, you know, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher and some of these. And he said, we're told by our rabbis never to go in there because it'll put a spell on you. And and I said, I said, well, that's really interesting because I actually didn't go into any of those churches when I was there. And he, he just stopped and he looked at me and he said, well, why? He said, aren't you a Christian? And I said, well, I said, the Torah is very clear that we are not to make any graven images and bow down and worship them. And I said, I saw that in a lot of those churches and I didn't want to go in there because I didn't want to trans transgress God's Torah. And he just, he looked at me like he was shocked. He said, really? And I said, really? And he says, do you what do you celebrate? And I said, I celebrate Hanukkah. I celebrate Pesach. I celebrate Shavuot. And he was just really kind of dumbfounded. And he looked at, he, it wasn't what he was expecting. He wasn't expecting a Gentile to have clung to a faith that's actually his, uh, to a biblical Torah faith. And uh, so that was interesting. And then what really um, struck me, and I remember this just like it was yesterday. And so then I was talking about my relationship with the Lord, and I used the term Abba. Uh, you know that Abba, meaning father, you know, in, in a very intimate way. And he stopped and he said, who? And I said, Abba, Adonai. And he just couldn't compute that I was referring to the God of Israel, you know, Elohim, the, the Orthodox community often refers to God as Elohim um, or Elohim, but they, they changed it to uh, Elohim. He couldn't compute that I was referring to the God of Israel in an intimate way. And something inside of him, I could see there was that, that stirring in his heart that this Gentile girl is talking with a familiarity and a, and a love and an intimacy about God. And why does she have that? <laughs> so it was a very interesting conversation that we had. And um, there were many others like that. There was another one that I wanted to share. Um, we met with a very influential radio host in Toronto. He had, um, I think it was like a, some kind of an interview show where he would interview all types of guests. And, and uh, we met him at a Jewish coffee shop one day and he started questioning our faith in Yeshua and, um, you know, just asking a lot of questions. And if I remember correctly, one of the questions that he had was about, well, how could God sacrifice, you know, make a human sacrifice, sacrifice his son? Um, you know, what is this Christian belief of, of, you know, God having a son and sacrificing it? And for, for us to open up the Torah scriptures to him, his own scriptures that he hadn't read about um, without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement, you know, and the scripture is pointing towards Yeshua, the, the, the suffering servant, um, you know, that God would become for himself the, the saving right hand for Israel to be able to open up the Torah to him and say, have you ever read this in your own scriptures? You know, you could see his, his mind just um, the blinders kind of turning like this, you know, a little bit of light coming through and saying, wow, maybe I should go and read my own Torah. And I find this so often that, you know, wherever we traveled and wherever we encountered um, and had the opportunity to share our faith with Jewish people, that, that that's a huge key is to, to bring them to their own scriptures. Um, there was another instance, uh, actually, it was with a young rabbi in Toronto. He was 
kind of an up and coming rabbi, if you want to put that, he was kind of popular within the Toronto community, he, really young guy, I think he was only 19 or 20. And we had a chance encounter with him at the passport office of all places or the, the driver's license office, we were renewing our driver's license and boom, we ran into him and he was a connection of, of Dan from long ago. And we started chatting with him and I don't know how we got onto the topic of Messiah. And Dan mentioned, I think it was um, the scripture from Jeremiah that behold, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Jacob. I will write my laws on your hearts, you know, and no man will, will need somebody to teach him. We shall all know God from the least to the greatest. And, and I remember him standing there and he's like, where is that? Where is that? You know, and he's looking, he's like, we've never heard that before, you know, and, and it was, it was just so amazing to, um, again, to bring our love of the God of Israel through the Torah, through this foundation, even to a rabbi who had never heard that, that, that particular um, passage before in his studies. I mean, some of the passages are, are forbidden. Isaiah 53 is forbidden uh, in some communities from being read, from being taught. Um, on that, on that uh, aspect, I, this is not my own testimony, but another of a Gentile friend of mine who was doing work with Chosen People Ministries in Manhattan back in the 70s. This is a really funny story. And so they're handing out leaflets with um, Isaiah 53 printed on them. And he handed one out to uh, an elderly Jewish lady, you know, quite you know, she's walking with a cane. She walks away, she takes it and she comes back. And, and uh, my friend John says she raised his cane at him. How dare you hand out this stuff about Jesus to me in the Jewish community? And, and he says, excuse me, ma'am, where is it written here about Jesus? And, and he says, this is actually from, from Yeshayahu. This is from your Torah. And, and she says, where do you see G? And boom, you don't even have to write Jesus on it. You know, and so again, here's a Gentile, another fellow friend of mine, walking out his faith in the Messiah from the the, the Hebrew scriptures, and it becomes an, inst an instrument to share the gospel of Yeshua. Um, another instance I had was uh, in Montreal. This is actually with some family members, and we were having dinner with them. Um, and there was a, a family situation where a marriage was taking place and the son was actually marrying a Gentile um, who was going through the process of ritual conversion called Gyur, where it's quite a long, um, a long uh, process. I think it takes up to a year, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the mother of the son was saying that she actually was quite... Um, not upset, but she didn't necessarily agree with the premise of ritual conversion. And she says, if it's not a conversion of the heart, what is it? It's just external. It doesn't mean anything. And I'm, and right away, boom, you know, I, I had an opportunity to talk about the conversion of my heart. You're right. It is about the heart. Adonai sees the heart. Man sees the outward in, uh, to intentions, but, but Adonai sees the heart is what the word says. And so I shared with her the conversion of my heart that I have clung to the God of Israel, that though I might not be Jewish by birth, his people are my people and his God is my God. And you know, the, as I'm saying this, I'm getting excited because it's like, I feel like I'm living the purpose of God for my life in loving his people in sharing his love with his people. Um, another powerful one, was in Florida, South Florida, where we led a concert and we were staying with a, actually a Messianic Jewish couple in the um, Fort Lauderdale area who had been ministering to a Holocaust survivor for many years. They're very close friends with her and they brought her to our concert. And at that concert, we shared the testimony of actually my background being from a German family um, and you know, Dan's background being Russian Jewish and how our marriage was not only a picture of reconciliation between Jew and Gentile and what is possible in the love of Messiah, but the reconciliation between German and Jew, German and Russian, because, you know, there was a lot of um, hatred between the Germans and the Russians and my family can attest to that. 
having lived through that, you know, my mom and dad living through that after the war. And so afterwards, um, this precious, precious woman, this Holocaust survivor who literally escaped by jumping off of the train and was one of the only, I think she said the only one of her family to survive, ran through the bushes, you know, one of these stories. She came to us and she said, how is this possible? How is this possible that, you know, you can, you can be reconciled? How is this possible that you don't hate one another? You know, and she was very, very curious. She actually invited us over. Um, and we had coffee with her a couple of times in her apartment. She shared her story with us. And I, I shared my background from, with her. And I actually shared the fact that though my, my mother grew up in post-war Berlin, she always had a love for the Jewish people in her heart. And even as a child, she felt shame over what had happened to the Jewish people in Germany. And so it was just such a healing time. And again, it was it was the picture of, you know, me being from that background and actually saying, no, your people are my people. I identify with you. I even identify with the fact that you were rejected by the church, that you were persecuted by the Christian church historically. I, you know, I take responsibility for that. And I say, no, you know, your people are my people. And my Messiah came from your people. He came for your people. He came specifically for you. And, and it was just such a powerful time um, with this with this lady um, of just sharing God's love, sharing his heart, sharing his plan that that he has a plan. And it's from the beginning to the end <laughs> that there is a, a huge apocalyptic plan that we are part of. And um, yeah, it was incredible. And then the last story I wanted to share is actually very, very recent. Um, this actually happened uh, this summer as I was in Toronto. Um, I'm a mom of two young kids and I don't often get to treat myself, but I decided <laughs> the children are with their Saba and Safta, their grandma and grandma, I am gonna go and get a pedicure. <laughs> and so of all places, this happened in a nail salon. And so I'm having my nails done and next to me, there's a lady talking and she's talking very loudly and she's talking about the pandemic and what is happening on earth. And she was you know, very passionate about what she was saying. And I could see that there was a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety and a lot of fear. And um, they, they moved me to kind of dry my nails and I was sitting right next to her and I had a chance to turn around and I said, you know, I. I don't mean I wasn't intending to eavesdrop, but I happened to hear what you were talking about because the whole salon could hear it. And so we started talking and she said, I want, and I said to her, I want you to know that I actually agree with a lot of what you're saying. And she was just, even though I could tell she wasn't a believer, she was saying kind of, I see that this is the end. There's something happening here and this is the end times. And so, you know, it was an open door for me to share. And I found out that she's Jewish and she's married to a Gentile man. And, and boom, there was an opportunity. Oh, you know what? I'm a Gentile and I'm married into a Jewish family. And so we got talking and just that opportunity for me to share my faith again with her in a Hebraic way. I started talking. I actually talked about the book of Ruth. I said, you know, even though I grew up in a Christian home, uh, my Messiah is Jewish. And she actually said that she said, yeah, you know, he he's Jewish and he came for Jewish people. And I said, yeah, that's right. And I went back into the, the Torah scriptures and she said, don't talk to me about the Torah. I don't know anything about my own religion, she said. But but all that to say, um, I was able to share with her the faithfulness and the goodness of God in my own tapestry, in the own tapestry of my life, through the difficult things that I've gone through, through through the trials, through the the turmoil. And I, and I, I said, you know what, God walks with me just the way that he walked with his people in, in, is in, uh, in Egypt, just the way he walked with them in Israel. He walks with me. I have a relationship with him. And my, my hope comes from something way beyond politics and way beyond healthcare and way beyond any of this. And I was able to share with her that my hope comes from the God of Israel and that all of this stuff on earth that's that's happening is actually written in her scriptures. 
that all of this um, stuff that's happening on earth, uh, God has already warned us about and the Messiah already talked about. So we don't have to fear. And so I was able to share with her my love of the Lord, my love for his people. And um, again, it was just an open, an open door. So I have found that my, my testimony as being one of Ruth has just opened so many doors um, that might have been closed if I would try to speak of my faith in more of a, um, I don't, and I don't, I don't want to divide right now. I don't want to bring division, but I just want to say, if I were to speak of my faith in more of a Christian way, um, you know, where we often present the gospel in the Christian church as um, come to, to Jesus and he'll forgive you of your sins and you get to go to heaven, it, everything true, I'm not saying that's not true. It's such a different opportunity because there's connection there. There's intimacy there. There's the, the barriers start to fall down when um, that person is no longer on the defense of, well, you're on this side and you want to convert me or, you know, no, I'm actually on your side and I want to introduce you to the one who fulfilled the Torah, who fulfilled the scriptures about the Messiah. So um, in transitioning now, you know, that's, that's been my experience as Ruth. So why do I think it's important that the, the church needs a Ruth revelation in these days? So I just made a few points here. Um, I, I don't really have any slides, but I'll just share a few points. And, and they were demonstrated by what I was already sharing with my experiences. But number one, Israel was on Yeshua's heart. He was the promised deliverer for the children of Israel. He was the one to come. He came for his own. So if it's on my Messiah's heart, it should be on my heart too, because he's the one whom I follow. He's my Messiah. He's my rabbi. He's my teacher. And I want to care about the things that he cares about. So um, if the church rejects Israel, there's a disconnect because if we reject Israel, we re basically reject our Messiah, because he is, that's his people, right? Um, you know, and, and I know that there is a, a longstanding um, replacement theology within the church where it's, you know, um, Israel has, the, the scriptures that were given to Israel are used as a metaphor and they're spiritualized to say that, well, Israel has been done away with and, and now all that is applied to the church, but that would never have been the understanding of the apostles of the, the followers of Yeshua, they would all understand the scriptures from a prophetic and a historical and a context that would mean, no, God will never break his covenant with his people. God is a covenant keeping God. And if he breaks his covenant with his people, then we are in great danger because that means that we are walking on shaky ground. So, um, and even in Ephesians, uh, when it says that, or is it Romans, he said he came for his own, yet his own did not receive him. But that was part of his plan. That was part of his plan so that us, the Gentiles, could be grafted in so we don't boast. It says in Ephesians 2, remember that at a time you were separate from Messiah, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. So we owe our salvation to the Jewish people because without the Jewish people, our Messiah would not have come because he came through them for them. And because of the rejection of some of them, God's plan was to graft us in through his great mercy. And so number one, Israel was on Yeshua's heart. So it has to be on our heart. It has to be. It breaks my heart when I've gone into churches, even to minister, and I see the flag of every nation on earth except the flag of Israel. And I think, wow, the, the one flag that should be, you know, central and not in worshiping the nation. I'm not saying that we worship and we, you know, we idolize the nation of Israel or the political state in Israel. But Israel is in this is God's heart. This is his prophetic plan. We need to have um, an understanding of that. Uh, number two, why does the Gentile church need a Ruth revelation? I think for me, uh, and I've ex expressed this through my testimony, so that we understand the fullness of our salvation, what it actually means. I think there's a focus uh, within, you know, a great portion of the Christian church that we're saved from our sins to go to heaven. 
again, this is true, but there's such a huge um, part that's left out when we don't look at our salvation in the context of God's eternal plan. And that is that we are saved from our sins, not just to enter heaven, but as part of the wisdom and the richness and the knowledge of God, my salvation is the mercy of God so that the Jewish people would be stirred to return to their own tree. And that's, you have to go back into Romans um, chapter 9, 10, and 11, where it's talking about Israel's unbelief and that the natural branches were broken off so that the, the wild olive shoots like myself could be grafted in. So our salvation is not just for ourselves. Our salvation is part of a bigger plan and a bigger picture. And I think when we realize that, it gives us even a greater sense of purpose in our faith. It gives us a greater sense of purpose in our prayer to know that I'm not saved just out of my sins, but I'm saved as part of God's plan. As a Gentile, I'm saved to provoke them to jealousy, to pray for my elder brother. I am the younger, he's the elder now. I received the covenants, the prophets through their lineage and out of the great mercy of God, I received salvation. And now what is my response to that? My response is now to lift my elder brother up and to, to show them the love of God, to, to express my love for the God of Israel, to provoke them to return those ones that were cut off to return to their own olive tree. So this is a huge spiritual apocalyptic plan <laughs> it's not just a very you know we look we, we look at life in a microcosm but there's a huge plan of god here and, and it says actually um uh in romans um hold on my bible's all all my concerts i have all my little notes here and they're all sticking up <laughs> in romans chapter 11 Paul expresses this plan after delineating all of this that, you know, the Israel part, part of Israel was cut off and then we were grafted in and then all of Israel will be saved. And he's going through this whole plan. And at the end of chapter 11, verse 33, how does he describe this? Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. And so we understand the full, fullness of our salvation when we cling to God's people, when we cling to his heart for his people. Paul says, again, did I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Um, another way uh, or another reason I think it's important that the Gentile church need a, a, a Ruth revelation. Um, and again, I reference this through the testimonies by becoming familiar with the culture and the customs and the family traditions of our adopted family, because we've been grafted into a family. We haven't created our own family. God has taken us and adopted us as sons into his family. When we understand that family, we're, we're able to better integrate and become part of that family so that we don't feel like, you know, uh, outsiders. Um, and we don't boast against the family then. We don't bring our traditions and, and you know, put them on the family. We, we become part of that family and we take on their identity as well. And that's how I've really seen it in my own life as as I've become part of the greater family of Israel through my love for God's people, I, I feel connected. And then again, where I'm be able to have better relationship. Um, number four, the presentation of the gospel in a Hebraic way breaks down the barriers erected by 2000 years of church history that unfortunately was steeped in anti-Semitism. And, um, you know, again, I can't go into all of the history of some of the, the church and, and what happened through some of the church leaders, but a lot of doctrines were very anti-Semitic and were the foundation for a lot of the pogroms, uh, even the Holocaust. And so when we, when we go back to the presentation of the gospel in a Hebraic way, it breaks down those barriers that would often be there because of 
the unfortunate history of the church. Um, number five, why does the Gentile church need a Ruth revelation? The return of the Messiah is inextricably linked to the Jewish people crying out, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Our partnership with God's heart is a prerequisite for the Messiah's coming. And there's a scripture in the end of the book of Malachi that says he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers. And uh, maybe I'm spiritualizing it, but I, I see it in this way that, you know, as I said earlier in Romans, that Israel is our elder brother. And we are almost like the children, you know, where we have received the faith through them. And our hearts need to be turned back to the fathers and to, to the fathers of our faith, to the prophets, the Torah, um, the prophetic scriptures, the, the, the Jewish Messiah. And as we turn our hearts back towards the father, they will turn our hearts towards us and we will become that one new man in Messiah, as it speaks of in Ephesians chapter two. Um, you know, Yeshua said in the book of Matthew 23, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are unwilling. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you that you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And so if we long for the Lord to return, we must be praying for Israel. We must be praying and interceding, keeping watch, being a watchman on the wall. We must love what God loves and we must love who he loves. And he loves the apple of his eye and he will never leave or forsake them, no matter what, what, no matter what turmoil, what judgments have come. His covenant is eternal and we are grafted into that covenant. Um, I'm, I'm concluding here with two more points. Um, number four, sorry, not number four, my numbers are wrong. <laughs> I was copying and pasting in my notes, whatever number we're on. Um, we six. can't, un <laughs> six, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Travis. <laughs> we can't understand the times and the seasons outside of God's calendar, God's prophets and God's covenant keeping nature. He has made known the end from the beginning. So another reason to have a heart of Ruth and to love what God loves is because we cannot understand what's happening on earth without the beginning of the story which is found in the prophetic scriptures in the writings in the, the foundation of the prophets um, and the torah you know there's a lot of interesting doctrines coming out in these days and and yeshua forewarned us that there'd be every wind of doctrine and 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 his his apostles warned us too but we cannot understand any of the happenings on earth without going back to the beginning. And so I really liken that to having that heart of Ruth who loves, you know, God's, God's law, who, who says like David, Lord, I love your law. And it is my meditation day and night. You know, it brings light to my eyes. Um, we don't want to, to go astray and create our own ending to the story that was never intended in the first place. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of that with, you know, false winds of doctrine and that type of thing, even about the end times. And so, um, you know, keeping the Moedim, the feasts of the Lord, gives us um, the opportunity to understand the, the God's prophetic nature and how he has made known the end from the beginning. And am I making sense? <laughs> I feel like I'm rambling a little bit. And last, lastly, and this is a really, really important one, and I've experienced this even within our own family. Um, why is it important for the church to have a Ruth heart? Um, because there is a rise in anti-Semitism right now. And we are faced with either standing for Israel or turning our back on Israel, just like Holocaust Germany. Um, I wanted to show you a painting, actually. Um, I could not find it. It's somewhere in my basement, but I had met a, a Dutch artist. I had the privilege of attending a, a two-week Bible school back in 2004 with uh, a Jewish man by the name of Art Katz. I believe uh, Janice Lola, Lola Klein uh, was part of uh, his community there for a while. 
And she had done uh, paintings, Jewish paintings, kind of just uh, depicting, you know, Moses and, and all kinds of Jewish history. And she had this one painting where uh, it's very, very difficult to look at this painting. You see the train uh, with the Jewish people lined up behind it going towards, you know, the concentration camps and on the hill, you see a church with a cross with no windows. And it's, it was a, it's a depiction of the fact that the church was sleeping. The church had its eyes closed. And uh, I mean, apart from many righteous Gentiles who, who did know God's heart, who hid Jewish people, who saved them, you know, Corey Ten Boom, and we hear all these stories. Um, apart from that, the, the large majority of the church was asleep. And because of that, nobody rose up. We're in those days again, and I know we we have our marches and we say never again, but any of you who were following the Gaza conflict earlier this year, I mean, I'm on social media channels for my music and um, I follow some Orthodox Jewish um, artists and uh, professionals in New York City. And so I'm part of a Jewish community of an online and some of the, the vitriol and the hatred and the absolute just demonic um, hatred that is rising up against Israel is scary. And we now find ourselves in the same position as the church. Are we going to stand with Israel or are we going to turn our neck and walk the other direction when it gets hard? And this is one thing that Art Katz always said. He said, will the church stand with Israel with rose colored glasses in the sense of we like to go and we like to wave our banners and we like to experience messianic music but are we going to stand with israel when it might cost us our life and that's a very literal thing what what if it costs us our life what if we have to hide a jewish person what if it comes to the point where there's so much persecution you know it's happening in europe it's happening in israel what if it starts happening in north america in fact it did over the course of this conflict uh, during the spring feasts in my former jewish neighborhood there were warnings saying, um, don't come out of your house on Shavuot. Don't come out because there's going to be mobs going through the Jewish community and they're going to be looking for mezuzot on the doors. They're going to be looking for, um, you know, stars of David's and kippot, and they're going to attack. And there were attacks in Toronto, Canada. And I know this was happening in New York City and Los Angeles. So um, will we have enough of a Ruth heart as God's people gentiles grafted in to stand with the jewish people in the face of persecution um and this got very personal for me within our own family because my daughter who's eight um has experienced the misunderstanding um i don't want to call it anti-semitism but maybe ignorance in her uh, Jew, uh in her public school in toronto they had a culture day where she shared that she's she's jewish and she was laughed at and she came home and she was pretty upset about it. And uh, in our new community here in Alberta, they are attending a Christian school, wonderful school. Um, the teachers, uh, the children's teachers know that, you know, we're of a Jewish background and we express our faith in Jesus, Yeshua in a messianic way. Um, but she was scared on culture day last year to share that was, she was from a Jewish background, has Israeli heritage, but she did. And one of the little boys in the school came up to her and she, and he said, Israel, that's just a fairy tale, just a fairy tale. And, you know, instantly in my heart, I felt, and I wasn't, I wasn't angry, but I felt saddened that this boy is probably from a Christian home and yet has never been taught anything about Israel. And so his faith or his family's faith, his church's faith, whatever, is disconnected from the very root that it came from. And, and so that's why it's important. I think one of the most important reasons that the church understands, gets that heart, gets that vision for God's people is because we're coming into very difficult days. The prophetic scriptures say that there's difficult days coming ahead. And uh, do we want to be on God's side or do we want to protect our safety and have our own way of looking at things? Um, so, yeah, I think... Having the, the heart of Ruth is, is critical. We cannot separate our faith from God's people. 
We cannot separate our faith in Jesus from God's prophets, from his writings, from his character, from his eternal plan. You can't do it. It's, it's one plan from beginning to end. And so I just, I pray that he would increase within us the desire to know him for who he really is. I think that's, that's always been my desire um, is to know God for who he really is, not for who I think he is. And um, in finding him the way that I found him, it has brought me to a different place and even my own personal walk with him where um, I can say that he's walked with me in that closeness that he has with um, some of the heroes of the faith that we walked about. I've seen his faithfulness the way that he was faithful to the children of Israel. I have seen him work mighty wonders in my own life, and I'm able to relate to that biblical and that scriptural faith. So I hope that's made sense. I was um, just letting the Holy Spirit talk through me. Did it make sense, Janice? <laughs> yes, I think it was awesome. And um, Travis, I'm going to pop in here a minute. What we'd like to do is have Dave and Raquel share with us. Dave and Raquel are the um, North American leaders over the TJC2 intercessors. Okay. And Dave and Raquel, if you could share with us along the lines of what Melissa said, why and how is TJC2 so integral to what she said? And then Melissa, Travis was going to ask you if you do one more song after Absolutely. they share. And sure. then we'll have Dave and Raquel, start us off in prayer. Travis, if you're going to have to step out um, for Israel and for uh, the Jewish people. I'm going to step out here soon, and I'm going to okay. uh, Dave and Raquel want them to talk. I put the, um, the seven points on the, on the notes for everybody. I took some more. Um, Melissa, I really took some notes because you really got me thinking about a lot. Oh, praise yeah. God. Thanks for you know putting what? those in there, Travis. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. The way that you interweave wove your story, so that it's not just not just powerfully uh, taught that you did, but you really the word has become flesh in your life. Um, you have the word of Ruth, you know, and I think that's what's so powerful about Yeshua Himself was the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So that the word that the Father spoke, the word that was spoken, actually, you know, was substantiated in flesh. And then here we go, we're looking at it, and then they uh, the Jewish people didn't even recognize it. But um, this is what God wants to do. He always wants to make his word flesh in our lives. So thank you. That, that This is something to think about, to study. But also, it's, uh, it's really brought to life by the way you've lived it out. So I want to thank you. It made very, very coherent, a lot of sense. And uh, put that there so we all can continue to think about it. And I'm going to hand it there over to Dave and Raquel. And um, I will I'll go off screen, but I'm going to listen as much as I can still. Thank you, Travis. We love you, my dear brother. Dave and Raquel, and then we see your hand up there, Mr. Swenson, after uh, Dave and Raquel will take a question, a couple questions. So Dave and Raquel, and then one more song from Melissa, and then we'll have a couple questions in prayer. All right. Well, shalom, everybody. It's, it's uh, very good. We had a meeting yesterday, which involved Japan and, and all of the stuff that's happening there in Slovakia with TGC2 with the with the healing the body of Messiah. So to get to hear Melissa's story and it just reminded Raquel and I so much of our own story of our first time attending Baruch Hashem Messianic Synagogue back in 1998, uh, 23 years ago, and immediately knowing that from that very evening, just within a few minutes of the worship service starting, that we looked at each other and says, we're home. Amen. And we've been there at Baruch Hashem now at the synagogue, and, and we've been serving as an elder there since 2002 and, and over all the prayer there. But the journey with Turgeon Council, too, uh, just truly didn't know that we were going to be having other intercessors leaders like, like Janice uh, leading those. We, we thought that the only one we would be leading would be in Dallas. And that's where we were. It was just leading there and then the faithfulness of God to just to walk that out. So uh, we, we totally uh, I just was very, very blessed by Melissa's sharing her heart and what her and her husband have done and, and just continually being faithful and realizing that uh, Jewish people need to need to hear about Messiah from their own scriptures. And then they're open to realize that the 
that the new covenant is also, the Bertadashah is, is also the very writings of Jewish people. And I like to say it this way, it's a whole lot, the, the, the new covenant scriptures are really a lot of commentary on what was Torah. And when you find that it's, you find the roots of it in Torah, then it, it stands, it, it becomes uh, not a divided, not something that's taken off in a whole other uh, direction uh, uh, away from Judaism, but definitely brings it to a fulfillment of what God's plans were. So that's really our heart with this. And uh, now we're blessed with our time with Baruch Hashem, with TJC2, Georgian Council 2. Do we have, I think we have intercessory prayer teams in about 40 countries. And so that's really kind of amazing to see what God has done over these years. And thank you, Janice, for hosting this, putting this all together. I'll let Raquel say, share what's on her heart as well real quick. Well, one of the things as we were listening to Melissa that we enjoyed very much, her testimony, was what came to mind. They said that uh, we really need to uh, recommend the book by... Um, Duncan. <laughs> we call him Papa Don, but it's Don Finto called uh, Your People Shall Be My People, mm -hmm. in which he expands a little bit more of what Melissa was sharing about and, and how his heart was also turned to the Jewish people. But uh, with TJC2, that's exactly what we are going to the root of of the division that happened between Jew and Gentile in the church, you know, way back. And so that's what we're addressing. And it's our, our um, goal really is the one new man to bring about the one new man. And so when that happens, then there will be that cry from the Jewish people for Yeshua to come. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. And so there's so many similar similarities on the walk that Melissa has gone on and then what the Lord is doing through TJC too. So um, love the music mm. and it's through worship, through worship that our eyes are open, our prophetic, the prophetic anointing flows and we begin to see, I love the way they says it. You know, we, we have heard that so much that People say Yeshua is the answer, but it says, if you don't know the questions, how do you fully understand the answers? And so it's that connection between the Torah, the, the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures that, you know, it's all so connected and there's such a foundation. We're going back to the foundation so mm -hmm. we can truly understand our Jewish Messiah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Would you all pray for um, Israel and the Jewish people? And then Melissa, if you could do one more song before, and then if you have something you want to share, be say before that, and then we'll have maybe two or three questions for our time remaining. Mm -hmm. So if um, Raquel and Dave, if you all would just pray, and then we'll go from there. Our Father, our King, Lord, we just thank you for your tenderness toward us, Lord, to bring us step by step, Lord, with, uh, with no animosity toward the roots of where you've brought us through the spiritual journey, but Lord, with an understanding and thankfulness that you've revealed us yourself to us in, a, in, in, in other ways and, and how you've showed us and have continued to show us your love for the Jewish people, your love for your family, and Lord, how you have chosen them and how you're gonna use them and how you're returning as the line of the tribe of Judah. And Lord, we honor you for what you've done and how you've just, uh, Lord, that you, you've told us that there's a veil, there's like scales over everyone's eyes, Jews and Gentiles. And by your great mercy that you have removed the scales so help us, oh God, to keep our hearts soft before you, soft towards Israel, praying and releasing the word of God in the right way. Lord, help us and keep us as I, I just join with Melissa and realizing that there's so many different things of winds of doctrines and what, but Lord, there is a true path. And Lord, help us to keep our hearts soft before you. Let the word of God continually to refine and 
and address the different things that would draw us off track and keep us focused on you. Yeshua, you are the center of everything, the center of all, all, all of time, all of eternity. You are the center of it. And so we thank you, Lord, for that revelation today. We bless you in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 Melissa. Janice, I just, something came to me there um, during the prayer that I just wanted to add um, very briefly. Um, that in our travels, we often encountered Gentile people coming to us and saying, uh, to Dan specifically because he's of a fully Jewish uh, heritage. You're so lucky that you're Jewish. You're so lucky. I wish I was Jewish. And I just wanted to comment on that because my answer to that was always, you have no reason to feel that way. Because if you look at the plan and the purpose of God, one is not higher than the other. We are, we are equal in God's plan. You know, if you look at the beauty of that that race where we're, we're running together. And so I think it's important to note that in, in uh, you know, speaking this message about Hebrew roots and, and all of this type of thing, that it's important for, for Gentiles to know who they are in Messiah Yeshua, that they're not less than, that they're not, you know, um, somehow less than God's plan. No, in fact, it's, it's the opposite. It's that was the plan of God. That was the wisdom of God that the Gentiles be united with the Jews and we work together. So I think that was just a little aside I wanted to add that, that there's no need for an inferiority complex in God's kingdom because his purpose is, um, is beautiful for both Jew and Gentile. So, and on that note, um, I think I'll close with a song from the prophetic scriptures. This song is from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, says Adonai, plans to give you hope and a future. Um, when you call on me and you come and you pray to me, I will listen and you will be found my, by me, declares Adonai. And that really, you know, it's a promise that was made to, to Israel when they were in captivity and many to this day are still in spiritual captivity. And it's our prayer that, that they would call, call upon me, says the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Draw close to him while he is near. And so I'm going to sing that as a prayer as we close. And, and again, I just want to thank Janice for inviting me to come and share my heart with you in a very informal way this morning. Um, I do want to just mention, I'm going to put it in the comments right now. If anybody does want to get my messianic worship music, I'm going to type it in here. Um, there's my website. It's uh, www.healingmelodies.ca. You can find all of my, um, my worship CDs on there. And, uh, and more information about my ministry. You can join my ministry mailing list. I send out um, meditations every second Shabbat or so I send out meditations on the scripture and new music so for anybody that would like to uh, I just put the website there so so this is um, this is Jeremiah 29 verse 11 oh, I had the wrong guitar apologize that's my practice guitar <laughs> <laughs> So Father, I just sing this song. It comes straight from your word. It is your heart for your people. You have good plans for us, plans not for harm, but plans for hope in a future. And when we look at the end of the story as is found in the revelation to Yohanan, the future is bright. The future is bright where we will be united with you, Messiah, forever and ever, and you shall be king over us, and we shall dwell with you. And this is for both Jew and Gentile who would put their faith and their trust in Yeshua, the promised Messiah. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. i yeah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mr. Swenson, did you have a question before we leave? We, we can't hear you. I think you. Bill, you have a question also? Okay. I have Mrs. a Winston. statement. I wanted to say that I enjoy Melissa greatly. And what, what I heard you say in your testimony is that somehow, some way, you made the Jewish people jealous because of your knowledge of the Torah and the Tanakh. And Henry Goulet has been saying that for a couple of years since I've known him. Make them feel jealous. 
But I also want to say it works the other way around too. My Christian friends are somewhat jealous because of my knowledge that I'm gaining by knowing the Old Testament. So that works out very well both ways. I also want to say one last thing is that the book of, it's called, This is Real and You're Completely Unprepared, is a beautiful book that mm -hmm. it helps me as a Gentile to really understand the Jewish holidays mm -hmm. and the full meaning behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, that book sits right next to my Bible, and that's something I'll read all the time. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful book written by a rabbi, just absolutely gorgeous. What was the name of that book? I think I saw it on Facebook the other day, Bill. This is real and you are completely unprepared. Yes, I need to find that book. I saw that. Alan mm -hmm. Lou, L-E-W, Alan Lou. It's just, mm -hmm. just a gorgeous book to give to any Gentile and say, here, here are the meanings behind the Jewish mm -hmm. holidays. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. Amen. Great. Yes, amen. Mr. Thank Swenson, you. did you get your... You can't get it. Yeah, you know, we're still not hearing you. Huh. And you're not muted. Hmm. hmm. Mr. Swenson is actually from Calgary. <laughs> yes. Good morning. Good morning. We still can't hear you at all. Can you hear us? We're not hearing you. And now you're muted yourself. But we can't hear you. Huh. I'm not sure. Yeah, we're not hearing you. Still not hearing. No. Well, I'm sorry. Maybe you could put a question in the chat and Melissa can um, get with you on it. Could you type your question in, in the chat? And then Melissa could get back with you on it. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, he's showing us a book, Judaism and Christianity. Uh, let's see, we can't see the author. We hold it up maybe a little bit more. Judaism and Christianity towards healing of the original wound of division, wow. And let's see, I still did not see the author, but that would be an awesome book. Could you type it in the chat for us, Mr. Swenson? I type it in the chat. Amazon. It's Donald, okay. uh, Donald Swenson. I'll put it in the okay. chat. I just wanted to say, too, what Bill had mentioned um, with provoking those who I encountered to jealousy. I think. Um, yes, it had to do with knowledge, but even more so, you know, uh, what the, uh, the scripture says that the law kills, but the spirit brings life. It's the combination of the Holy Spirit's empowerment on those prophetic scriptures, right? Because, I mean, obviously, there are many that know more, way more about the Torah than I do. But um, when the Holy Spirit's power breathes life into those scriptures, that's the power and the power of the love of the Messiah, because as it says, um, you know, he who raised Messiah Yeshua from the dead now dwells within us, quickening our mortal bodies. So it's that power coming out from the Ruach HaKodesh through the, the word, but through that, that Holy Spirit unction, that is what really, really penetrates the heart. I just think of Stephen, you know, before he was stoned and, and he was preaching from the prophets. He was preaching from the all of the prophetic writings, the Torah, but it was in the in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so that's that's uh, really you said what I meant to say. Yes, no, no, I know I wasn't. It wasn't a criticism. I just, uh, you know, I'm just trying to say, like, I'm not a Torah scholar by any stretch. So. <laughs> Yeah, and, I'm not a rabbi. I'm not a scholar. <laughs> so I do love and, the Lord and his word, though. And Janice, right, I, just, I just wanted yes. to say uh, what Don Swenson was trying to say is, is he's the author of the book. He just oh he, wrote, is, oh, he just wrote, wrote that book. It just came oh. out not too long ago. And so it really sounds wonderful. So that's what wow. Don was trying to, to let us know. Praise Adonai. Amen. Amen. Praise Adonai. So maybe well, he can it, put in the chat, maybe he can put yes. in the, chat the name of the book and, and everything for every for Let's everyone. See if he put it in. 
Okay. I, he hasn't put it in yet. Don, could you put, write that in? I think he's putting it in the chat now. And what we'll do is he's doing that is we're going to have Pastor Priscilla Juan. Pastor Priscilla Juan is from Faith, Hope, Love, House of Prayer. And she and her team, the Ohio Prayer and Worship Network, have actually joined hands with TJC2 Columbus and helping us to get the message of TJC2, the initiative of TJC2 out in the city of Columbus. She and her team are a godsend to us. Raquel and Dave, I just want to tell you what they are absolutely a godsend. They, their timing of coming in and they're an answer to our prayer for someone who finally hear us. So we'll keep them in your prayers. We really appreciate you, Pastor Juan. She's going to end us in prayer. And Pastor Juan, did you have anything you wanted to share before we leave? Um, I'm just, again, like everyone else, thankful for Melissa. Thank you for pioneering what you pioneer and just TJC too. You guys are at the tip of the spear. I'm just honored to be joining you guys in this uh, because I, I do believe in the days to come, we will see a message that not many people understand come to the forefront um, more and more. And it's just wonderful to be able to run with a group of people that get it and can impart it and um, have been walking in it for years. Um, because uh, I know that we need it. So um, yeah, I'm just gonna pray for you guys. And Melissa, I'd love to um, you know, talk with Janice and get you here to Ohio again. And uh, I would love more people to hear the message that the Lord has put in your heart. I think you're perfect with between being a musician and a Gentile who's connected with the Jewish people. I think um, there's many points of, of um, just being able to relate that, that will help bring many. So. Jesus, we just thank you for this group. We thank you for TJC2. We thank you for Melissa. Thank you for the um, body of Christ that you're bringing together in Yeshua HaMashiach. God, we thank you for the revelation of um, what you intended in the family of Adonai. Thank you that you long for Jews and Gentiles, uh, for believers across the world to be one new man. And we just ask for wisdom and revelation um, and grace to. Um, to proclaim that, that longing in your heart, like Melissa said, um, that you, it matters to you deeply. Um, it is uh, the apple of your eye is something that is tender in your heart. And we just ask that you would um, give us the honor of just partnering with you in that tender space in your heart where you care um, for the, the body of Christ to come together, for the revelation of your promises and covenants, um, the zeal you have, to see them come to pass. Father, we just ask a blessing over every person in this Zoom call and those uh, who will listen to it in the days to come, God. We ask that you would uh, imprint on our hearts, a stamp on our hearts, a greater um, measure of grace and understanding and wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Yeshua um, to, um, to partner with you in what you're doing in these days, in these end times. Um, help us to stand rightly with Israel, God. We ask that you would teach us how to um, provoke our Jewish brothers and sisters to Christ and um, for us to be provoked as well as we hear um, uh, just the wonderful things that you've put in them as well. And we just bless you in um, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. And Amen. And we did see that we get the we got the information for the book. Thank you, Mr. Swenson. We got that in the chat. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to our next month together. And Melissa, thank you. Thank you so much. This was a very rich time. And to those of you that are watching us on Facebook, thank you for joining us. And may Hashem bless each of you. Those of you who are observing the holiday, Kog Sameak, it is absolutely a great time of uh, some Torah tonight. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you all and shalom, shalom, shavuot tov.